Hi everyone, I'm Abigail, this is Megan, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. We, today we are joined by Newbery Medal winner author Claire Vanderpool. Ms. Vanderpool has written the books Moon Over Manifest and Navigating Early. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, I'm excited. How much of, of what you do starts with the words, what is? How much of what I do starts with that? Um, pretty much all of it. Yeah. In fact, it's funny that you say that because when I give talks on writing and, you know, talking to students or adult writers or whatever, I always talk about that. I have a, um, spiral notebook that I start out with and I just start writing a lot of what if questions. What if this happens? What if that happens? And so, yeah, it's, that's where it starts. Good question. What is it about historical fiction that you love? Mm, I have always loved, I've been, always been a very nostalgic person, somebody who kind of likes um, thinking back when I was young or looking at old photographs, looking through my mom's old scrapbooks when she was a girl or my grandmother's scrapbooks. And I've always liked kind of imagining what it was like. Um, And I like reading uh, historical fiction. I like history. Um, I think it's just kind of interesting to try to put myself in another time and place and I've always said if time travel ever became a real thing and if I knew it was safe I would sign up how much research goes into your books and how do you do it well it depends on the book but uh with moon over manifest there was a lot of research because that was a story that takes place in two time periods that were both in the past and so I did a lot of research about you know, World War One and the Spanish influenza and uh, and then in the later time period, um, you know, the Depression and what it was like for immigrants during the early part of the 20th century. And um, so that was a lot of research. With Navigating Early, there still was some. I went on a research trip to Maine, wanted to kind of see what, what uh, I'd been to Maine before, but it had been quite a while. So I wanted to go and just see about the place I was writing about put myself in my character's shoes and kind of experience it the way they would have. And I did some research for that too. I had to kind of know about um, boats and rowing and, you know, just different things that pertain to uh, living in Maine. So yeah, quite a bit, but I enjoy that. I enjoy the research process. How much of your books are influenced by your own life? Um, I wonder if this is true for any writer, but I think a lot of it is, you know, it's their characters who are made up. Some, some characters are based on real people that I have known or, um, you know, parts of different people that go into a character, but I think it just is pretty natural for a writer to draw on things from, from your own life. Um, and it surprises me sometimes when I look back and see where something came from, like in navigating early, you know, that's a story. Uh, This boy is uprooted from his home in Kansas and put in this boys boarding school in Maine. He's very much out of his element. And I initially would have said, well, no, I haven't had that experience. And I haven't had that same experience, but I've had the emotional equivalent of that because the grade school that I went to and all those classmates went to one school and I went to a different school. And so it was a very similar type of thing, you know, where I just was all of a sudden Uh, with people I didn't know and feeling like a fish out of water. So, you know, sometimes it's not the exact um, scenario that is the same, but it's the emotional equivalent that is the same. What is your process when putting a story together? Do you decide the end before the middle or do you put it together in order? Again, it depends on the book. Um, With Moon Over Manifest, there's some letters in there from Ned, who is the soldier who's away at war. There's letters that he writes home. Those letters come up in the story sporadically. You know, you kind of find them, you read them throughout the length of the book. But I wrote those all together because I wanted the letters to reflect this young man who's going away to war. So his first letters are all kind of, you know, he's excited. He's He thinks it's going to be a big adventure. And then as the letters keep coming, you can imagine how his tone changes what he's talking about changes so I wanted to I wanted to write those all together so that I could kind of 
have an arc like that. Um, yeah, I think there's always some back and forth. Um, there was a whole scene in Moon Over Manifest that I wrote after I actually completed the book. And that was because my editor said she wanted another scene with the girls kind of uh, doing something adventurous. And, and so I, that was difficult because you already have a whole story arc. And I said, you know, how I'm just asking myself, how am I going to write a scene that is not going to stick out? Like I, you know, somehow just inserted it. So um, that was a challenge, but I think, I think it went okay. Projection is a part of most writers' stories. Can you tell us about that part of your journey? Uh, well, if you had asked me earlier, let's see if I can find it real quick here. With every writer, I would imagine, has, you know, a little little stack of rejection letters that they've gotten. I read somewhere that Dr. Seuss had gotten 26 rejection letters before he was published. And wow. my stack is a little bigger. So I'm kind of proud of this, though, you know. Uh, and these were some, a lot, most of these are from a book, a manuscript that I wrote before I was published and that is still not published. So most of these are rejection letters for a manuscript that really, when I read it, it it's not really up to speed. Um, so I can see why it got rejected. Um, but yeah, it took some wherewithal. Like I, I hadn't looked at these rejection letters for a long time until I was giving a talk on perseverance. And I pulled these out and then I was kind of asking myself, well, how did I keep going? Because that's a lot of rejection, but I think I just had enough uh, of a desire and some, some confidence, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely part of the process. You're right about that. One of the hardest rejection letters I ever got uh, was also the most complimentary of my writing. And it was saying how much they liked it and they liked the character and and this was the part that killed me. It reminded them of Richard Peck, which if you've read any Richard Peck, it's the, um, you know, a year down yonder and a long way from Chicago. And I love those books. And so they said, you know, we, we love this. It reminds us of Richard Peck, but we already have Richard Peck. It was the same publisher that publishes his books. And so that's why they were saying no. And that was just a killer because, you know, it was so complimentary and they were, but it was still a no. Um, so that was hard, but you're right. You do have to kind of view it through the lens of, okay, you know, it's not right for them or, but you also have to be honest with yourself and think, well, you know, maybe this isn't the book that's going to get published. And that's what I kind of found with the first manuscript, which I call the book in the drawer. Cause that's where it still is. Um, I had to decide, you know, like, okay, this obviously isn't quite ready. Do I want to start another book and, you know, work at this again or am I just going to let this whole dream go? And I had young kids at the time and it was hard to find time to write. So I had to kind of do a little gut check there. And I decided, no, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to try it again. And that, that was when I wrote the, the book Moon Over Manifest. There are very few people who won the Newbery Medal with their first book. Can you tell us where you were and what your reaction was when you found out? Yes, I can. And I was standing practically where I'm sitting right now. This is now a little office, but back then it was, let's see if I've got my dates right. Maybe it already was an office. This used to be a little breakfast area and the kitchen's right there. And I had taken the kids to school and I came home and do you want me to tell you this whole story? Cause it's kind of funny. Yes, sure. um, well, my husband happened to be home and he typically would have been at work at that time of day. I think it was about eight 45 in the morning and the phone rang. And for some reason, our phone used to do like a little double ring if it was a telemarketer and, and that's what it did, you know, like a, a number that is that you're not familiar with. And so I almost didn't answer it, but I answered it. And I should give you a little backstory though, because my dad had been in the hospital for six weeks. And this was on Monday. My dad had just come home from the hospital on Saturday. So keep that in mind. Phone rings. I answer it. Yes, this is Claire. My husband was sitting right here and I was right there. And um, she said, that she was the chairperson of the Newberry committee and that my book had won the medal. And I started crying. I mean, that's shocking news and huge. So I started crying and I wasn't talking because she kept talking. She kept giving me more information or the committee was on the phone, whatever. But I knew like this side of my brain is just so excited at this news, but this side of my brain knew my husband is seeing me answer the phone and, and start crying. And he thinks my dad has died. Oh, no. and, and I was, I wanted to tell him to, you know, but I, she, she kept talking to me. So finally, when I got the phone, he came over. In fact, I think he's coming home right now. 
And I just put my head on his chest and he said, what happened? So then I was finally able to tell him uh, what the news was. And it was very exciting. And then just kind of all exploded that day. Well, I'm glad your dad is okay. Yes, thank you. (laughs) We have interviewed a number of authors who have had books banned. This means in some parts of the country, kids don't have the same access to books that we have and may not be able to see people like themselves represented in books or a window into other people's lives. Could you give us your thoughts on this? My thoughts on that um, are probably what most of the people in the country feel about it, which is that, you know, we have freedom of speech and it's a right that should be protected. Um and yeah, I, I see what you're saying that, you know, when you take away somebody's voice or somebody's words, um, you know, it's one thing to say, uh, you know, I'm not going to purchase that book. That's a personal decision. But to say nobody else can read it, uh, that does not ring true to who we are. I think. Um, what writers have had the most influence on your work? Well, I already mentioned Richard Peck. I really like his writing. I love Madeline Lingle. If you've read any of the Wrinkle in Time books, love those. Uh, the, the books I'm talking about are books that a lot of which I read as a young reader, not Richard Peck, but Madeline Lingle, Scott O'Dell wrote Island of the Blue Dolphins. Um, who else? Of course, the Narnia books, C.S. Lewis. Uh, we traveled a lot as kids. My parents would take us on road trips, like three weeks in the summer. We had a travel trailer. And so I remember driving up to Prince Edward Island in Canada, which is the home of Lucy Maud Montgomery, if you've heard of the Anne of Green Gables books. And my mom actually, read. Actually, huh? I, my aunt just recently gave me Anne of Green Gables and my mom really? and I are watching Anne with an E right now. So, Oh, okay. Well, I love that. In fact, my mom read the story to us out loud on the drive up to visit her home. And then I bought a, like a set of books there of the Anne Green Gables books, brought those home. So really like those. But, you know, as you get older, you read different things. So um, as a writer, I think probably the writer who has most influenced my writing is a writer called, named Wendell Berry. And he is a writer who lives in Kentucky. And his stories all take place in this fictional town of Port William, Kentucky. Um, And they're all characters that, you know, you read this book or that book, and it's all characters that you've encountered in one story or another. Um, Yeah, I really love his writing. In fact, I got to meet him, got to have coffee in his kitchen a few years ago, which was really fun. What advice do you have for young writers? Well, it's when I give advice like that, it always sounds like, oh, that's what we always hear. But it's true. Just to be a reader, you know, read, 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 which I did growing up. My mom uh, was a school teacher before she was a mom. And um, she taught all of us to read at a pretty young age. And so like before we were in school and we'd go to the library and check out a lot of books. I had two older brothers and I, a younger sister, but she'd take us to the library and it always sounded kind of strict. Like she'd say, oh, okay, you can each only check out 20 books. And we would come out now, granted, mostly picture books, but she'd take in these grocery sacks and we'd come out with, if it was my brothers and myself, you know, 60 books and we'd <laughs> spread them out on the floor or all of our picture books and, you know, um, just kind of be physically immersed in these stories. So being a reader, Uh, Because really, that is the best writing workshop, you know, the best way to learn about writing and stories is to read. The other one, and this sounds very obvious also, but to write. I mean, you know, if you knew how many people have come up to me and said, oh, I've always wanted to be a writer or, oh, I've always had this idea for a story. But they've just never sat down and put words on a page. Um, So those are the two big ones. You know, I've always kind of told myself like in term before I was published you know when I was just wanting to be a writer I would think okay well what are the odds there's a you know I'm sure publishers get all kinds of submissions all kinds of people that want to publish a book how am I going to improve my odds well if I actually sit down and write something then I'm already ahead of the game because like I just said there's so many people who want to write but don't then I thought well if I actually finish something then my chances are even better 
And then I would think, okay, well, if what I actually finish is actually good, <laughs> then my chances are better. So I studied the craft and, you know, read a lot of books on writing. I joined a writer's group. I go to writer's conferences. So, you know, just all the things that you would do for anything that you want to get good at. You have to, you know, you have to do it and you have to study it. Reading and writing is the big advice. But do you also have a smaller tip? Maybe something that you do when you're writing? That maybe a lot of people don't. Hmm. You mean besides eating M&M's? <laughs> mm, I guess that would count. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let me think. Let me think if I could come up with something better. Um. Okay. So two things. First of all, this is the in some ways the lesser of the two or the, the one that would come later is being open to critique, you know, being open to somebody else looking at my work and giving me suggestions and actually being open to receiving that, you know, and not just saying, well, no, this is the way the story is. You know, you got to be open to revising. And the other thing is sometimes just easing up a little bit. And this is the advice that I need to hear right now because I've had a hard time finishing the book that I'm working on. Um, and so I think it's sometimes just getting out of my own head, you know, not worrying about a publisher, not worrying about readers even, you know, but just writing the story that I want to write. And almost, you know, I almost was, I think I was fortunate with writing Moon Over Manifest. I didn't have a publisher. I didn't know if it would ever get published. So I just wrote the story that I would have wanted to read when I was 11. And, and then with Navigating Early, I was well into writing that story before I even knew Moon Over Manifest would be published. So I kind of had this sort of the same advantage. This one is a little different because I know people are going to read it. And I think that, you know, I have to kind of just set that all aside and just write the book that I want to want to read. Yeah. Can, can you tell us about that book you are working on right now? The one I'm working on right now? Well, I usually don't tell too much about the work in progress, but um, I will say it is set in the past, but not as far back as the other two books that we've talked about. Um, I have a very personal connection to what this story is about, which could also be why maybe it was a little challenging to write because it is, it's fiction, but it comes from a kind of a very real personal place. Um, it's, it's similar to the other two in that it's, you know, there's some mystery, some adventure. It's funny in places, I think. So, um, yeah. And I, I'm closer to getting it done than I was, uh, even a few months ago. So I'm happy about that. Does it have a working title? It does. But I think I'll keep that to myself oh. because that could still change. Yeah. That's because true. Both of, the, both of the books we've talked about, Moon Over Manifest and Navigating Early, those were neither one of those was the original title of the book. Can you so, maybe tell us what they were called? Yeah, Moon Over Manifest, my original title was Divining No Man's Land. So in the story, Miss Sadie is a they she appears to be a diviner, kind of like a, you know, if you know what a diviner is. Well, it actually has different meanings, but um divining no man's land no man's land is a term for that place in a battle that's in between where the two sides are you know no man's land so i like that title but the publisher said um i think they sometimes they want something that's going to be more appealing to a young reader on the bookshelf and they didn't think that was what would be the most appealing i like it um the navigating early that was originally called sandbagging the ocean and if you that's there's a character at the beginning, the, the boy who comes from Kansas sees this other boy on the ocean, I mean, you know, on the beach, and he's filling these sandbags with sand. And it looks like he's sandbagging the ocean. So that's where that title came from. But there again, I changed it. Finally, it's time for our turbo team. 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Number one, what is your favorite phrase to use? Well, if you ask my kids, they would say my favorite phrase is, let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll Number go with two, that. Okay. what is one subject you'd love to learn more about? Well, if this counts as a subject, I would love to learn to play the guitar. Number three, what is your go-to snack food? Mm. 
cheese curls. Mm, yum. Number four. What was your favorite book growing up? Island of the Blue Dolphins. No, or a race of the It's close. If you could teleport somewhere right now, where would you go? Well, definitely into the past. I would go to a typical summer day when I was 10. Number six. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Mm, I know this is rapid fire and I think too much about these questions, but a superpower? Uh, time travel. Yeah. Nice. Number seven. What was your favorite cartoon as a kid? Scooby Doo. Number eight. What's your favorite rainy day activity? My favorite rainy day activity. Reading. Number nine. If you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Living or dead? No rules. No rules. No rules. Um. Let's go with Madeline Langle, Eudora Welty, and Flannery O'Connor. Finally, number 10. What's the best piece of advice you were ever given? Oh, this is easy. I was working and uh, my schedule was super busy. And... Um, I went into one of my bosses basically, and I had typed out my schedule like for an entire month just to show like weekends, evenings, you know, blah, 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 working, working, working. So I showed him the schedule and he said four words to me, who sets your schedule? And I was like, oh, me. So basically he was just saying, then do something about it. And I have taking that advice to heart the rest of my life in every realm, not just in my schedule, but I have a lot more control over things and a lot more um, agency in my life than I had given my, myself credit for. And so that was life-changing. You did awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so much for spending this time with us. We can't wait to read your future books. Well, thank you so much. You guys did a great job.